Tonight we're gonna read Vampire Child by Ruby Jean Jansen. Let me darken the room and we shall commence. He has returned to taste the blood of the innocent. Night of the Vampire. She stared at the movement of curtain in the breeze, the easy fluttering of ghostly white against the wall. Somebody was sucking on something. She heard the faint smack of lips, a quiet intake of liquid. She went into the hall. She could see through the open door of Patty's room, and in the dim light, she saw a huge black blob hovering over the bed, like something from another world. It had no definite shape, though she could see the droop of a long wing, and at the end of the wing, claws, one or two, curls. She screamed, and the thing lifted its head and looked at her. Its head was small and hunched between the sharp, bony rise of folded wings. It had a wide mouth and teeth that gleamed in the dim light. Two long fangs dripped blood, one drop from each fang. She saw the blood clearly as it fell to the white sheet folded a few inches over the light blanket on Patty's bed. She rushed toward the bed, then whirled back and turned on the ceiling light. When she turned again, the terrible bat-like creature was gone. Patty was sprawled and pale, and she realized he was dead. Prologue Black wings Black wings beating against his window pane Big, big black wings that stretch from one side of the window to the other not smooth, silky wings with feathers like birds, but something else, something that came in the night. A terrible place, shrunken, wrinkled, with a wide mouth and long, sharp fangs. A slit mouth that reached from one side of the head to the other, with sharp, pointed fangs in front, jutting out toward him, striking the glass of the window pane. The eyes were gone. There were only holes where eyes had been, rotted holes, deep and empty. He screamed, and the light came on, and the window pane reflected the room, his bed, his mother coming in the door. What is it, Patty? she asked, taking him into the safety of her arms, holding him tightly against her, pressing his face to her bosom. But he couldn't say. He couldn't describe what he had seen. Wings, he wept, clinging to her, trembling, but the word told nothing of what he had seen. Night terror, she said. Bad dream. Go to sleep, Patty. It'd be all right. But he was afraid. The bad thing with the sharp fangs and the wings wanted him, was coming for him. One night, it would get into the house, or it would find him playing in the yard. It would get to him, and he would never be Patty anymore. Chapter 1 Babbitt Walk, trembling, listening. The blind in a small bedroom was drawn to close out the weird, dancing figures created by a street light shining through the leaves and limbs of a tree. At first, she thought the blind had snapped off, as it sometimes did scaring her, waking her, making her too conscious that she was alone in the house half the night with her two and a half year old baby brother, Danny. The noise making him scream in his room next to hers, but her room was dark and the gyrating figures played in silence beyond a blind. She turned her head slowly, breath held and looked into the hall. The night light in her baby brother's room glowed like a strange, dim, white moonlight in the hall. She thought of the downstairs and the bars on the windows. All the houses in this older part of South Dallas had bars on the downstairs windows. It made her feel safer. In the evening, 
after Mama had gone to work and there was no one in the house but herself and Dan. It helped her mom feel better too. She knew, though Katie still cautioned her every day to never open the door to anyone and never leave the house. She heard the sound, something that could have been part of the old house drying in the summer heat. But it was inside, close, the quiet movement of someone. It sounded like Mama walking in her room or in the hall near Danny's room. She must be coming back to check on Danny, as she always did when she came home from work. Babbitt drew a breath of relief. They were no longer alone. She turned over onto her right side and felt the lifting of the burden. It was always the way. It was always that way when Mama came and the baby was no longer Babbitt's full responsibility. Kitty walked through the room from the one car garage to the back door of the house feeling that someone was right behind her, as she did every night when she walked these few dark feet. A key was in her hand, but already she was wondering, wary, half angry at Babs. The light in the kitchen was out. Hadn't she always told Babs not to turn out the damn kitchen light? There was no backyard light in this old dump. Never had been, and never would be, according to the stingy landlord. She had lived here almost three years, two years and seven months to be exact. And for the past two, she had been coming home from work at 2.30, the middle of the damn night. And all the time, the only light she had at the back of the house was the kitchen light. Babs kept turning it out and Katie kept telling her not to. Finally, Babs seemed to be getting her head straight and remembering, but now the light was out again. She expected more from a girl of 14. She had to be angry to keep from being frightened. The darkness moved around her. The tiny backyard was filled with black shapes that swelled toward her. She imagined dark hooded men who crept to back doors and waited. Some didn't wait, but went on it, only slightly deterred by a locked back door. She didn't try to use the front door ever because it had a bolt, and she wanted her kids to be as safe as possible while she was at the bar serving drinks for eight hours. But it wasn't the possibility of burglars that scared her deep down, filling her with a cringing, withdrawing fear that could turn into helpless panic, into a crushing world of nightmarish terror. Burglars sneaked in, took what they could find, and left. In this house, there was nothing to take. There was one TV, black and white, with a plastic exterior and scratch face, and a volume knob that came off in your fingers. She had brought it two years ago at a garage sale for ten dollars. Who would break in for that? The blankets, sheets, and dishes were worth nothing. It all came from Goodwill. No, it wasn't burglars who scared her. He was here, somewhere. The child she had called Patty with love once upon a time. She sensed his presence. For several days now, she had been afraid that he had found them somehow, even though when she sent him to live with his father three years ago, after he had killed Billy, she had taken Babbitt, who was 11 then, and moved without leaving a forwarding address. There was no one in the world she had contacted. With her daughter and another child on the way in a few months, she had moved to Dallas, halfway across the country from her home in the Northwest. She had rented this house with bars on the windows, tucked in among other houses, shopping centers, businesses, and tall mirrored buildings that formed the Dallas skyline. She had tried to lose herself and her surviving children among the people on the street. Dark skinned, as if they had been in the hot summer from birth. They spoke a language that was foreign to her much of the time. No one knew her. She had only one purpose in life, protecting the children she had left. Danny was born here, one night at midnight, with only Babbitt as an attendant. But even in the throes of her misery, she hadn't wanted anyone else. A local doctor had come in just long enough to make out a birth certificate for Danny. And then Katie had gone back to work, and Babbitt was left to babysit from 6.30 in the evening 
until 2.30 in the morning. Fortunately, Danny had been a good baby and had slept like a little log from six o'clock on. That's what natural childbirth does, the old doctor had said when she took the baby for a checkup, as if the natural birth was something Katie had chosen instead of something she had been forced into by circumstances. Makes a contented baby. Working in the darkness, her fingers found the keyhole in the doorknob and inserted the key. The lock turned with difficulty, as it always had. Kitty began to breathe again. At least, no one had broken in the back door. Babette had just forgotten the light again, that was all. She felt inside from the light switch and the darkness was suddenly dispelled. The naked bulb shone down on the kitchen spare furnishings, the row of dark cabinets, the old chip sink, the stove against the wall, the round plastic covered table. Babette had left the kitchen clean as she always did. No. <clears throat> Katie stooped and took off her shoes, but her eyes were searching the dark hole that led to the front room the extra room in the middle of the house that had no furniture, and the stairway up to the three bedrooms. She could see the light reflecting on the glass of the front door with its protective bars. She listened, all her senses alert. Patty, Patrick, would she know him now, at age 13? At age 10, when she had last seen him, he was deceptively sweet-faced, as perfect as a flower. No one had known her fears as she watched him growing, becoming something that terrified her. It was impossible that he could have found them. She had been having the jeers, that was all. She'd go upstairs and looking on Danny, just as she always did, and then Babs, and find them both sleeping just like always. She picked up her shoes and carried them with her, leaving the kitchen dark. The floorboards creaked softly in places along the hall and up the stairs. She didn't turn on the light. The dim night light in the baby's room made a dreamlike glow in the hall. And she was led by it, comforted by it, as she climbed the stairs. On the landing, she stopped. An eerie sound sent chills deep in her being, to the depths of her soul resurrecting terrors that lived in her nightmares. It was the same sound she had heard three years ago. And once before that, when Patty was five, the soft, almost soundless sucking, the pulling of life's blood. She dropped her shoes, her ears thunders with rushing fear as she ran to Danny's door. The night light plugged at the foot, plugged? Mm -hmm. The night light plugged at the foot of his narrow bed revealed a dark figure hunched over the body of her small, helpless son. She wanted to scream, and her mouth opened. She wanted to scream, and her mouth opened, but there was silence except for the suck. But there was silence except for the sucking of a baby's blood. Her hand sought the light switch, and a yellow glow, only slightly brighter than the night light, opened up the scene. The figure leaning over the bed reared and looked toward her. His face was much the same, but older, more handsome. Black blown hair fell in the loose curls on one side of his forehead. His cheeks were thinner, his lips full and red, his chin stained. From the corner of his mouth, blood ran, trickling in two lines down his chin, making him look like a puppet with a hinged jaw. The scream in Katie's throat was no more than a cry of fury and terror as she plunged toward the figure on the bed. Hands out, fingers curled. She intended to kill him with her bare hands, to destroy him as she should have years ago. Babbitt was shocked and walked by the sound of fighting, the bumping of bodies against the wall and floor. She heard someone trying to scream or cry out as if they were being strangled or in a nightmare and unable to voice their fears. Before she was fully awake, Babbitt was out of her bed and running toward the door, even as her instinct urged her to turn back, hide, cover herself. But Danny was in there, closer to the fire. Why wasn't he crying? 
disturbed by the sound, sleeping. He was still sleeping, thank God. Entering the hall, she saw two bodies struggling in a streak of light from Danny's bedroom. She had a brief, flaring realization. The sounds she had heard earlier, the sounds she had thought were made by Mama, had been made by an intruder after all. Someone had broken into the house. And no, there were two bodies locked in a struggle, and she wasn't sure if one of them was a mother. She saw blood shining red, glistening in the darting tracks of light as the figures turned. Edging closer to the banister, bending against the sound of cracking wood, she saw blood on hands and faces she didn't recognize. The fighting figures didn't see her. Screams burst incoherent from one of them. I'll kill you. It was a woman's voice, but Babbitt wasn't sure if it was Katie's. There were more words, words that sounded like, you can do this to me. Why are you doing this to me? You can do this to me. Why are you doing this to me? But they were mixed with other sound, the cracking of the banister, of feet against the floor, of grunting so fierce it could have come from animals fighting in the pen. Her back against the wall, Babbitt slid past them. When she reached the opening to Danny's room, she turned and ran onward to the top of the stairs down and headed down, falling part way, rolling helplessly over the sharp edges of the riser before she managed to grab the banister and pull herself to her feet again. Numb to her bruises, she ran to the front door and began fumbling with the locks. Light from the upstairs bedroom hardly penetrated this shadowed area. Beneath the stairway was blackness, like a dungeon. And into that blackness, one of the bodies fell screaming, the cry ending abruptly as the figure struck the floor. Under the street light, on the corner stood a group of Chicanos, young men mostly, at least half a dozen. At least half a dozen. Ordinarily, Babette would have been wary and would have crossed the street to avoid them. They carry knives, her mother's heart warned. Be careful. But now she ran screaming toward the men, and they seemed to understand her need without her voicing a coherent sentence. Several came running toward her, and the others turned to the payphone under the light. Babette whirled back toward her house. My mother! Someone is hurting my mother! They went ahead of her into the house, strumbling over the threshold. She saw the light had been turned on in the entry, and one of the guys was bending over the figure on the floor, offering a helping hand. Babette saw Katie, leaning against the man who bent over her. With the back of one hand, Katie was brushing her hair off her forehead. Babette stared at Katie's hand. It was red with blood. Blood stained the fingernails, the long, carefully tinted nails. It stained the palm and slid in slow rivulets down her wrist. Yet, there was no blood anywhere else except the front of her blouse, as if she had brushed her hand there. Kitty was helped to her feet by the man. Babette saw movement on the stairs and looked up. For a moment, she didn't recognize the figure coming down. His face was covered in blood. Blood was sneered across his chin and ran from long cuts and scratches on his cheeks. He came down the stairs slowly and stopped at the bottom. And all the while, his eyes were on Babbitt. He stood within six feet of her, and she looked into light gray eyes that were strange, yet in some way vaguely familiar. Then he spoke, his voice calm, as if he was in shock. Mama tried to kill me. He said. Babbitt stared. Patty? She said, incredulous, disbelieving. Patrick? Mama tried to kill me, he said again, and he began to cry.